Good evening to all of you. I am very glad to be here with you after the MCO. Uh, this is my uh, third trip flying out. The first time I, after MCO, I will fly to Singapore to see my daughter. Then uh, two weeks ago, I was in England for the Lambert conference. And now, this is the third time I'm flying. Uh, my wife is very panicked. He said, uh, the COVID is still very, uh, very alive. Don't know when the COVID is going to go. Uh, don't worry. Today, we are here and we are very glad. Uh, let me say a prayer. Lord, open our eyes to see Jesus, our ears to hear him speak to us, and our hearts to believe and follow him. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to uh, introduce myself a little bit. You, you may have heard of my name, but uh, I want you to know a little bit more uh, than where uh, I come from, uh, then you will appreciate more uh, the things that I will say, certain, certain things that I will say. So I think I take off this. Uh, I came basically from a uh, Buddhist Taoist family. I grew up up to the age of 20. And I went to overseas and studied in Melbourne. And when I was there, uh, I was converted in the Assemblies of God Church. But the church was too far away from where I studied. So I ended up in the Church of Christ, which was a breakaway Baptist but reform, very reformed church. And that church does not believe in uh, infant baptism, and the church does not believe in many things. Uh, they are very like brethren, more like a brethren church, this type of stuff. I grew up there for years, but I was privileged that I, when I was the first became a Christian and one brother was assigned to me to lead me. He, he journeyed with me and in those days we don't call disciples, we call follow-up. Uh, today we use the word disciples, discipling. Those days someone follow me up and walk with me, teach me how to read the Bible. Uh, if you have any questions, I will you will answer, answer and then we memorize scriptures together and we bounce our thoughts together for nearly a year. I have this privilege now, you understand? For four years I was doing my engineering course and I felt the call of God but I was told at that time uh, get the world experience first. So I listened to the elders and I went into the world and came back uh, to serve in West Malaysia. And I was uh, first in the Lumut Naval Base, where now the LCS is. <laughs> I was building that shipyard where LCS is parking now. <laughs> so when you talk about LCS, talk about the Lumut shipyard, I was there. But I didn't complete the whole thing. I, I did one section of it. My company sent me to East Coast in Kelantan to start a new job. And that job is a hundred million uh, job. Because the uh, Kelantan government for, uh, from 1951 uh, until 1978, it was all passed. Amno took over, or Pradik took over in 1978 later half of 78. And then immediately Tunggu Razali pumped in, borrowed one billion from World Bank and pumped in to Kelantan and developed Kelantan. And wants Kelantan to be the next KL, those days in the 70s. So I was sent by the company, again, we got a job uh, to build rural roads and bridges. And so I was thrown there and 
never had this real experience, only a short experience in Lumpur Naval Base. So I was not even doing bridges, was doing all this harbour and shipyard thing, nothing to do with the bridge. So I had to go to Kelantan. My boss told me, now you are here, if I see any bills without your signature, I will not pay. So my boss came to that point and trusted me, he says, because the, the, the cost is, the, the, the project is 100 million and every uh, claim, every month claim is a million dollars, a million dollars, over a million dollars. So we do that. I was privileged in a sense, was trusted by the company and by the boss. The boss only come once a month and I have to run all the things, not knowing what is Kelantan like, and not knowing that it is a monsoon area, and in November, December, you have, can't do anything. And so I have to learn all these things and plan, plan my work, plan my job. I finished 15 bridges and all the roads in two years. Don't ask me how, but it worked. And I went through many experiences, with my car overturned into the river and my car nearly slipped into the ravine and so many, you know, I climbed up to the scaffolding about three, four story high uh, and where all the studs and all the fastener was all removed uh, so there were, God has his hands over me at that time I didn't understand why now, I look back now after 40 years serving God I, I knew God has a purpose behind. So I tell you this is because uh, uh, it has to do with discipleship that I, I grew up that early years. And I was the first Christian in the family and my father scolded me and I was in Australia, I became a Christian, I wrote a letter back and my father sent a cassette. <laughs> I wrote a letter, he sent a cassette. Two hours scolding me, then two hours. I should have kept that cassette and make it as a you know, archive, you know. But I, I was so sad that I, I, do, uh, I record songs over it, so no more, no more scolding. <laughs> and so, those were the days. And I was the first in the family now. My family, 80% of my family uh, became Christian. And they assume 20% uh, more to go. Uh, I have the privilege to baptize my own children, my mother, my brother, my sister, and as a bishop, I confirm my brother, my sister, and my others. Also. So they had the privilege of those. Uh, now I look back, uh, we thank God for all those things. Now I want to begin by telling you this story because it was a privilege that I had, uh, was given. And with that privilege, I cannot hide it and I cannot lock it into a the closet in which I don't do anything with. Now, uh, I'm retired and I want to tell you retirement is the best thing because number one, no PCC, no sinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best retirement. Now I'm free, I can, anybody invite me to preach, I preach, anybody invite me to teach, I teach. Uh, so you don't lock down by any other things. But I'm, I have been appointed uh, in 2016 uh, to the, the chair of the Anglican Communion Disciple, Intentional Discipleship. And this year, in January this year, uh, I became the chair of the Commission of Evangelism and Discipleship with church planting and discipleship all coming together. Because of my privilege to be the chair of the commission, then I have the privilege to go to the Lambert again, which a retired bishop not entitled to go, but I go there as a speaker, not as a participant. Uh, so, to, for that, I, I ask the question, why did they chose me? And they say, they can see the passion, and they can see the track record. When I was uh, a priest, the first parish that I had on my own is uh, St. Peter's Ipoh. 
And in St. Peter's Ipo, I went there, there were 19 people, 9 zero, 19 people. And I asked God, why did you send me back to my hometown, where my auntie is in the PCC, and then, you know, you don't know what to say to your auntie and your uncle, you know, they don't call your name or call pastor. <laughs> so, susala, for all these things. So I pray, I say, I can lead people's mother to Christ, but I cannot lead my mother to Christ. My father passed away very young. You know? So, we prayed. Finally, my mom came and I baptized her. Three, three times the bishop, two bishops, my, three, my first bishop, the bishop was ordained me and the bishop after me, uh, after the, the second bishop, both also wanted to send me out from the parish. And the bishop called me, Hun Hei, I want you to trans transfer you. Uh, please get ready. Uh, I packed my things and told the church I've been transferred by the bishop. So the, the people gave me dinner, farewell dinner, 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 dinner for one month, and then the bishop called up. No, 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 you are not going to stay. <laughs> so I, I packed. Three times, second bishop did the same thing. And then I, I asked the bishop second time, the first time I didn't ask, the second time I asked the bishop, Bishop, why didn't, why did you tell me to pack and I pack and then you told me not to go? And the, the, the bishop told me, I look around, I don't know who to put in, your, in the parish that you lead. I can put you in another parish, I don't know who to put you there. I said, very simple, just put the guy there, or anyone, you just put it there. And he says that you started too many ministry because not only one language, many languages. So we, finally, I stay in the parish for twenty years. Twenty years in one parish, and usually we don't let the priest stay so long because he's and either he's stale or the, the parishioners I think get bored with him. Uh, so twenty years there. I planted 50 churches and I raised all the church that the bishop never sent me a new priest to, or never a, a curate priest. So I raised the people and I raised even to send to the diocese and the diocese every year the bishop called. Wouldn't he do any more people to come for study? You know, every year asking so the people he will take, he will take. So, I think the track record uh, is, I'm not sharing this to tell you that I, what I can do, but sharing this where I was selected because of track record. So when I became a bishop, the, there was a fourth time I had to leave, but at this time I, I, I left because I was selected to be the bishop. And I didn't want to become a bishop because I liked the grassroots, I liked the people in the ground, but uh, God has his own plan. So I became a bishop, and I knew that I cannot go and do the same thing that I do. But this time, I instigate, and I encourage, and I journey, and I help the priest in the diocese to plant another 50 churches uh, for the 13 years as a bishop. Now, I retired. The first thing, I go back to the church, I talk about discipleship. I, I don't I don't hold any church now. I go back and I encourage them. And I encourage a young priest. So in July, we started one church. And August, we started another church. Uh, so I believe the church, if any church do not plant church or do not expand church or plant congregation, uh, the church is a sign of stagnation. And a sign of stagnation means the church will slowly die in years to come. This is my belief. So because of that, I was so passionate to do all these things. Now I want to share with you. Now you understand the background and the passion that I have. So I, I may not give you a lot of biblical uh, exegesis, but I will give you a lot of practice, practical ways of discipleship. But I will still encourage you to go back to the Word of God. You have the notes with you. The notes uh, is all printed out. 
uh, you can understand that. Before you go on, I ask one question. So you don't have to answer me. I hope that you will answer your neighbor, the one beside you, either left or right or behind you or behind you. Okay, just very quickly answer. What is discipleship to you? Just quickly answer yourself. Talk, just stop. One minute. Just talk to each other. Yo, the one. What do you think discipleship is? No need to tell me, just tell each other. What do you think discipleship is? If you finish telling your neighbor, tell the one behind you, the one in front of you. Don't worry about the answer correct or not correct. But say to each other, what do you think this discipleship is? a lot. I can see you very actively talking. Okay, let's come back, okay? Now you are looking at me. I'm just one person. The person with the name Ng Moon Heng. You put a brethren to me, I'm brethren Ng Moon Heng. You put a bishop to me, I'm bishop Ng Moon Heng. You put an ask bishop to me, I'm ask bishop in money. You put a dato to me, I'm dato in money. It is still the same person. But if you put Jesus into me, it's a different person. I repeat, if you put Jesus into me, I am a different person. Now discipleship is putting Jesus into you. If discipleship does not put these musicians into you, that is not discipleship. That's church mention. I, I want to start very direct to you. If you come to expect a course, you will be disappointed. If you come to expect a diploma or degree, you will be expect you will be disappointed. If you come to expect that it is going to be a license to help you to go through something else, you will be disappointed. But you come to expect that you can put, allow Jesus to come into you, you put Jesus into you, that is discipleship. That is putting Jesus into you. If Jesus comes into any one of us, your life will change, will be different. The problem is that sometimes we think we know about Jesus, we think who Jesus is. We think a lot, a lot of things about Jesus. We, we know the knowledge about Jesus. But then, somehow, Jesus skimmed through us, through our mind, through our eyes, through our ears, skimmed through us, through our hands, but never stayed inside. If we never stay inside, Revelation 3, 20, we'll still, we'll still be saying the same thing again and repeating, I am standing at the door, knock, knocking at your heart. Same thing, you will need Jesus into it. Some people will have Jesus in, but then somehow, don't know what happened, Jesus was squashed out and he didn't have Jesus anymore. Don't know how to get Jesus in. If you want to get Jesus in, discipleship is to get Jesus in, inside. That is called a true disciple. Now let's go back to the, the screen. Uh, we look at the next screen, at the discipleship, what and why. If the words are so small, you can see from your notes, sir. The biblical understanding of discipleship, I will cover this area. I will cover Jesus' concept of discipleship. Of course, I'm skipping through very fast because time is not long. Just early church concept of discipleship, 
the traditional churches, including the Anglican Church, the concept of discipleship, and today's church concept of discipleship. And we will see whether there is any difference. I will help you to skim through, and then we will see why did they do things like that, what are the things that they are doing inside discipleship. If you look at all these things, then you will appreciate the, disciple, the real discipleship behind. We go to the next uh, one. We will look at Old Testament. The Old Testament, the word disciple never existed. You can never find the word disciple. Even we look at the word disciple in Greek, it is called matetes. It is learner. The right word is apparentis. Apparentis. Or a learner. Or some people call it a student. So that is Greek. When you go back to the Old Testament, it is Hebrew. You know, what do you call disciple? Now I quote the words here in the Old Testament. It says, And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. We heard this many times. That is discipleship. The Old Testament concept of discipleship is that did you put the Lord into your heart? He says, you put the Lord into the heart so that you fear Him. You put the Lord into your heart so that you can walk in His ways. You put the Lord in your heart so that you love Him and serve Him with all your heart, all your soul. You put it in. It's almost like a love relationship, a boy and a girl love relationship. If you love each other so much, you know, you feel your passion, you work, you dream, you walk in everything for him, for her. So he says, that's discipleship. The Old Testament concept of discipleship is to put the Lord your God or Yahweh into your life. And the Jews were told again and again and again and again. But we saw in the Moses leading the Israelites out of the, of the Egypt and into the wilderness. And we saw that they are the one who the whole group of them came out, millions of them. But no one entered the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. You ask the question why? They all knew about the Lord. They think that they fear the Lord. They think that they love the Lord. But they don't have the Lord in their hearts. They don't carry it. Only Joshua and Caleb carried the Lord. And when they went to spy and they came back, he said, we, we have the Lord with us. We don't worry about the rest of the people who have fortified walls and they are like giants. But we have the Lord. That is when you put the Lord in. So, we all know to keep the commandments. The Pharisees keep the commandments. They keep very well. They memorize the commandments. But the thing is that the Pharisees, Jesus says, they are hypocrites. They don't have the Lord with them. If you have the Lord with you, He says, then you will feel for the people. You will not bully. You will not step on other people's toes because you have the Lord with you. You feel for them. He says that if you have the Lord with you, you will imitate and reflect His character and the character you will be changed. Because the Lord comes in, you cannot not change. You have to change when the Lord comes in. I want to tell you that when I went to Australia as a non-Christian, I was so excited. I'm the first one in my family who go to university and first one to go overseas. Everybody was happy in Clapham. So, oh, you were so good that you can go. So I was happy and I, I told myself, I'm going to be a civil engineer and I'm going to study and work hard and I'm going to graduate and go to become a civil engineer and come out and work. And after I work and I will 
gain all the experience, I will open my own company and then I will buy my house, a big house, and I might I employ many servants and I have many fleets of cars, uh, many swimming pools. Oh, that was my dream. When the Lord came in, all this dream gone. All disappeared. And I came back and the people asked me, hey, wait, what happened to your dream? At that time, I was just only a few years old Christian. So I came back. I said, no. I, they asked me, why do you come back? You should have stayed in Australia. Don't come back. But I came back and, and I said, I wanted to be a pastor. Half pistol. Oh, the world crumbled. I want to be pastor like him. <laughs> so that's how you know, all the things all began to. I asked myself, what changed me? Why did I change that focus? I was so clear with that focus. But it was changed. That I don't have all these things. So one day I, I went to my church in St. Peter's after I became a priest and I was pastoring some years and often I, it reminded me this and then I was sharing again. So I said, no, you know, I wanted to be the you know the great person in my big house. So now I also got a big house now. I got a church. <laughs> Very big. So wow, I got a lot of workers. You see, I said, all of you are wow, working together, co-workers together. Wow, so happy. Then I got a lot of, uh, of cars, but I don't have a lot of cars, I don't have bands. At one stage, I had 20 old bands in the church because I got a lot of ministry. Wow, and then finally, I say, uh, I got swimming pool, not one. I, got the, I say, I got now baptism pool, not one, got two. One upstairs, one downstairs, baptism pool. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all changed. But it's not just Jesus says, no more fishermen, fishers of men. That concept changed. No, no more fishermen, but fishers of men. Discipleship transformed and changed. So the imitating and the reflecting of God's character. Look at Jesus' disciples, the 12 disciples, the apostles. God transformed them. They, the three years they followed Jesus, they couldn't understand. Suddenly, on the day of Pentecost, Jesus, Peter was transformed. The rest was transformed. To the point, they were so scared, just a year ago, Jesus was captured and to be trial, all the disciples disappeared. And after the Pentecost, Peter stood before the crowd and Peter was put into jail. He didn't run away. And James, in Acts chapter 12, faced martyr. You ask the question, why didn't they run? And Jesus came into their life. They are transformed and changed. The value changed. The outlook changed. And here it says, they are reflecting God's character. And they live, living as people of Yahweh. The Old Testament is the same thing. The people, we only saw Old Testament, we thought we saw Old Testament is the King David, or he got the kingdom. But we didn't see Old Testament. Joseph. Who is Joseph? Why should Joseph still believe his God? He should have hated his God, abandoned him. First, I hated my God, I abandoned because my God didn't protect me from my brothers. My brother wanted to kill me. He didn't kill me, sold me to Egypt. Secondly, God, I didn't want to, I thought give more God one more chance. I, I thought God would protect me, but he didn't protect me from Potiphar's wife and accused me and put me to jail. Never mind, give God one more chance. God, now I share the dreams, explain the dreams of the, the, the bread maker and the, the wine dresser. Hey God, how come these people forgot about me? I did well in the jail. And God never listened, never answered. 
What makes him special? We only saw when he became the Prime Minister, the second man after Pharaoh. But we didn't see his struggle. The Bible said he was 17 years old. And by the time when he became the Prime Minister, we were 30 years old. 13 years. How many of us can stay 13 years questioning God? God, I pray and trust you, nothing happened. I trust you, nothing happened. I tried very hard, nothing happened. One time, two times, three times. But because his life lived as a people of Yahweh, he changed. The Bible keeps saying, the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. We didn't see only him. We could have seen so many other people in the Old Testament because when their life changed, that is the real discipleship starts. And sometimes God makes discipleship in an easy way for us, but we don't want the easy way. So if God gave us the hard way. Moses went through the hard way. Very hard. 40 years as a prince, 40 years as a shepherd. The 40 years he, to the point Moses forgot about all the pomps, all the greatness of the power and the, and the, the wealth and the, the pomp that he has. But yet, Moses became a shepherd. And God spoke to him. And God saw that this hard time is preparing him for another 40 years to come. Another 40 years. So the Old Testament actually has discipleship right inside there, but it was not mentioned the word discipleship. But it was, if you change the word, to be a person of Yahweh. Let Yahweh live in them. So the next slide, we will see how they develop in the Old Testament, how this discipleship are developing. The training and mentoring of new leaders or successors. So they mentor and train new leaders. And they don't even know who is going to be the new leader. But they just mentor them, train them, and equip them. Eli's sons thought that he, he's my Eli, my father is a, is a priest. So I, we were all, they are priests. They are from the family of priests, so he will be a priest. But they have no transformation of life, and they became terrible guys. So God chose Samuel. He's not Eli's family. And Samuel, God spoke to him. So whenever you read the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, when God spoke to that person, that means that is a really a life. A life connection. Now you ask, no wonder God, how come I didn't hear from God? God didn't speak to me. You better ask our question. Where is God in our life now? So far, so close. Because God spoke to them. The moment when David sinned, David was hearing from God all the time. God spoke to him, God spoke to him. You know, in the wilderness, he was running around. God spoke to him. You know, he wanted to kill Saul, but God spoke to him. He had the impression that he should not kill God's anointed two times. And how can David sin? He didn't hear from God anymore because God was outside. The relationship cut. God was outside. God so David cannot hear from God until he had to send Prophet Nathan. Prophet Nathan, Takula, you speak to the king. Eh, potong lele lo, kau lah. We did say. So he took cook up a story. You know, there was a guy who had a lot of sheep, and there's one neighbor got one little small ewe. And then, you know, the story. You know, he say like that. Then finally, this guy, his friend, come and he didn't kill his sheep, but he. So, took the little small you and kill him. All his friend. Oh, David so angry. Mm, I'm going to kill him. Take more lives. The prophet Nathan said, hey, Oh, then your majesty, you are the one. 
Zhou Han to speak, to say to the king, who can order him death. Because David cannot hear from God anymore. So prophet Nathan came and speak. My friend, if you need a prophet to speak to you, look at the scripture. Be careful. That means you are not hearing from God anymore. When you are not hearing from God, you need a prophet to speak to you. You need a pastor to speak to you. You need a priest to speak to you. Because we are not hearing from God. So the training and mentoring of new leaders and the successors is part and parcel in the Old Testament. They train them, but how many really put God inside their heart is a different story, but they train them how to hear from God, walk with God. The whole one thing is to walk in holiness with God and understand the character of God. So all these people, and even though there are schools of prophets in the Old Testament, a lot of schools of prophets, they're training the people how to hear from God, listen to God. Look at the prophets Jeremiah, prophet, you know, Joel, prophet Haggai, prophet, all these things. God spoke to them and they heard. You think that they like to do the things God wants them to do? Nobody, no prophet likes to do that. No prophets. But because the world was evil, so God has to speak to them and say, do. Now the second point I want to say, that is training and mentor. Today we have training, you are here very good, I train and mentor you. But the whole thing is that I say, it is not a cost, it is put Jesus into your life. How to put Jesus in your life. Then you have to come to tomorrow lah, huh, to sit here, the, the second part of it. You're here today and if you don't come tomorrow, then you still watch the video. Huh? The video is for you. Huh? Uh, so the next part is discipline of the family. A parental role is very crucial. And this is the part that a lot of Christians don't do that. When I was a young pastor, I went to the church. I visited all the old people because my church at that time I went to the church. The church was only 40 years old. So the old people were still around and they were in the 80s. And so I visited them. They would tell, tell me all the story of the past. Oh, how the church was formed, how we all do jumper sale, how we do race fun, how we do uh, cook. cook cooking of the Easter eggs and how we do the Christmas celebration. Oh, no, they tell me all these things, all these things. Are, oh, so great. They are the founders of so many of the founders. So great. The early founders. Then I look around. None of their children are in church. I didn't tell them. I asked myself, God, what happened? These are the people who, there was no church, they founded the church. They commit themselves, they give their life, they give their money, they give their time all to the church. Where are their children? No one around. At that time, I asked myself, God, I don't want that to happen to my family. Because we entrusted today, we call outsource the nice word, outsource to someone else to do the job. We outsource it. So we don't do the job. And there was one story. One, one not real, one, one, it's a real story, it's not real, so I cook up a story. It was in my kindergarten. The church had the kindergarten. So the church kindergarten, one day, you know, the, the parent of the child came and complained to the, children, to the teacher my son, you know, complaining that this girl in the class, his same class, you know, every time pinch my son and make him cry. And I, he, he said, see, red, all the time pinch, you know, red color here. And the teacher took this, the boy, that took the girl aside. Did you pinch? No, 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 no. No pinch. Did you pinch? No, no. Very young kindergarten. No, no pinch. Then the, the teacher told the girl mother, he said, this mother complained that her son was pinched by her daughter. The mother told her, 
Did you pinch him? No, 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 no. See, my daughter said no. Children don't bluff. Do you pinch him? No, 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 no. Then turn around when the, the, the mother took the girl up to the car. The mother pinched her. Tell you don't tell lies. Tell you don't tell lies. <laughs> the teacher immediately knew. Where did, the, where did the daughter learn the pitching from? <laughs> it's not by teaching. They caught not by learning. They learned by catching it, not by teaching it. So the children, our children, will catch what we do. They will catch whether you pray, whether you really pray, or you're just only token prayer. Whether you really believe or you only token believe. So the parent role is very important. Now today, if you want to talk about discipleship, if you are married or you have children, but your, your children are really grown up so because a lot of people already have grandchildren, let, can they be your disciple? Can your children or your grandchildren be your disciple? That's crucial. The Jewish people are very important of that. To we'll lead all the Jewish people to read the scripture. They don't know how to read, they will make sure the rabbi will teach them at their home. They will also practice the Sabbath, they practice the sacrifice, they practice. Of course, those families who don't practice, the children won't catch up. But those who practice will learn from them. They will all learn from them. Samuel is too young. He has no one to learn. So he has to learn from Eli. He had, at least he learned from something. They say, how come Eli's son don't learn when he learns? Eli's son was already big by the time, but he learned because he knows when to offer sacrifice, when to pray to God, when to not bluff, when not to take people's faith. How? So these are some of the things that our parental role is crucial. Take, believe, take it, you are a disciple, whether you like it or not. And your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors will look at you and see that you are a disciple, a good one or a bad one. The teaching and impacting community is the same thing. We say about, oh, evangelize, evangelize, you witness to the community. Our witnessing is our life. Our life is the biggest witness to, to show to everybody. You say one thing, you do another thing, your life show. Very simple, you know. You score the neighbor, how oh, can you? You sweep the rubbish here. And then you, he didn't see also you sweep back the rubbish there. <laughs> Immediately the guy will say, this guy go to church, huh? huh? Which church, huh? I won't go to that church. I got a church man, I, I, I got a, I, a member who didn't want to come to church, the wife come to church. Every time the wife say, visit my husband. La. Okay, la, we sit, la. I'll go and visit, I'll talk to him nice, nice. We sit many times, you know. Then I just one day, hey, I didn't do that. La. <laughs> <laughs> then I asked one day, hey, brother, your wife come to church, why don't you come to church? He told me, he said, you counting my wipers. <laughs> like that. Uh, who wants to become Christian? Uh? You know, at home, don't do this. Don't do this. Everything argue. Everything fight. So I said, don't believe. So after many years, finally he believed. Then I asked him, hey, why okay with me? Finally he believed. <laughs> so he said, now better. Uh. <laughs> then he believed. Sometimes it is a testimony. The testimonies are there. But some, we, we have come to a stage that we, we use the excuse, the Word of God. Actually, the Word of God is very good, very powerful, very important. I'm not downplaying it, I'm not designing it. It's very powerful, very good. But we use the excuse and cover it. We don't know the Word of God, don't know how to preach, don't know how to speak. So, no need love. Don't know, ma. The next point is propagating and promoting the function of the Word of God. Actually, the Word of God 
has to enter your life. That means you must believe. It's very simple. I ask you one question. Eh? Hope you don't mind. Eh? No, I'm very direct here. Uh, we talk about tithing. 10%. Simple. Church also talk about it. Tithing. Very good. 10%. I want to ask, how many people tithe more than 20% but don't put up your hands? Just answer yourself. How many tithe more than 30%? How, how many times? 50%. Nobody dare to say. Why? Because we do you really believe in tithing? Yes! I didn't ask for 10, you know. I asked for 20, 30, 40. Of course, nah, you ask for 10, then I'll raise my hand. Nah. I ask for 20, 30, 40, so much. The Bible only tithing is 10%. Man. If you really understand the Bible, allow this thing to come in. First, let me give you an example. If you earn uh, now minimum is minimum which is 1,005 so I use 1,005 uh, example uh. if you earn 1,005 but you need 1,008 to survive obviously you don't have enough money isn't it? how do you give? you want to give 10% I can give 10% uh. not enough really so I do Oh, I felt tighter, you know, cut this, cut this, cut this, and try to, you know, ask people to blanja here, blanja there. Because I don't have enough money. Do you think God won't understand you? Understood? Sure. Even though you offer less than 10%, God will understand you. For example, now, second part of it, you you need 1,008, but you earn 2,000. When you earn 2,000, you need 1,008. If you give 10%, 200. So you still get 1,008. Ngam ngam no? Enough just to cover yourself. Now, if you need, if you earn 3,000 now, 3,000, you need 1,008. Because you earn 3,000, so you upgrade yourself, you know, from MyV uh, to to a Honda or something, then you upgrade yourself a little bit here. You know, you don't eat in the roadside store, you know, you read the restaurant, you upgrade it. Let's say you need 2002, but you already earn 3000. So you give 10% to God, 300. So you got 1007, uh, 2007, but you need 2002. The extra 500, 2007 minus 2002. I want to ask a question. The extra 500, the surplus 500, does God has a share? You have extra 500 after giving 10%, after upgrading your life to 2002. I give one more. You earn 10,000. Now you upgrade your life to 6,000. Because you are a lot now, bigger house, bigger car, bigger things, everything, 6,000. So 10,000, you give away 1,000 to 10%. So you got 9,000, but you need, you need 6,000. So you got 3,000 extra. Does God have to share the 3,000? Any amount from the 3,000 you give is more than 10% already. Can you see that? The only thing that we are mind lock ourselves, 10%. I give 1,000, 10,000, I give 1,000. Lock already, the rest, buy. But God is actually saying, you got surplus, huh? Do I have a share? Let me change the word. God said, do you have my heart? Does God live in you? If God lives in you, He has a share. But does He have a share? Let's say 3,000 surplus. You give one more thousand to God, you still have 2,000. And now you are giving 20%. Can you see? That's why I ask you the question. It is not the amount. It is how much you have got. Discipleship is talking about where is God? How much God is in you? 
That's discipleship. We once you have that, you can just run and God will capture you definitely and flow you along. Because God only waiting for such a person for such a time like this. So if you think that you are even better to go to the next step, if you can be a simple life, have a simple life, you don't need 6,000. You should come down to 4,000. Then you have surplus of 5,000. You say, God, I take half, you take half. You give 2,000 miles to God, you give 2,000 miles. And 2,000 miles plus 1,000, you got. You have 35% you're giving because you have a simpler life. We never look at this thing this way. If you are a real disciple of Jesus Christ, if how much God is in you. And God will share whatever you have in surplus. Well, He has a share. Think of that again. So the Word of God should come into that way and to transform our life. Not the Word of God is to knowledge, but it is in there, in the heart. When I was uh, in SDM, when I was give, giving my life to God, in 1982, I entered into the seminary. I was an engineer. At the time when I left my engineering role, and I came to SDM, and I, I didn't know what is happening. I only knew that I'm giving my life to God. And my family was very against my father on that day when I when entered to SDM refused to talk to me until he died. I have this, you know, don't have the privilege to talk to him until he died. Because he didn't want his son. He says, You you become a Christian, I already tahan you already. You now become a pastor. You're worse than a drug addict. He did degrade my family. I'm the first son to go overseas, so he cannot take it. So I have to swallow a lot of, of, of this, uh, whatever, guilt or feel or failure, failure as a failure as a son, whatever I swallow that take the time. So that was the time. Then I went into STM, and I realized that STM when I study, I was paid the rest of the. Of the, of the school fees, by the diocese, the food, so paid, you know. But I was given forty dollars, forty ringgit pocket money, one month. That including buying my toothbrush, buying paper, buying ink, buying pen, and even buying soap, buying all these things, including my offering. And then, bishop, at that time, think that I was. Uh, a graduate student, so send me to St. Mary's. It's a very important place, you know, very important. Take the cathedral, a very important place. So send me. And then I sent there, there was four services. Every service come, you know, I also try to put coins because of sound. So I put one ring in. One ring in. in. Have later on changed the one ring in into coin. Wow, that's not my face. But that was another story. La. <laughs> one ring in, I put. And another service came, another day. One day, four services. I really, my 10% give it to you. Half-paced, uh, four, one month, uh, four, four times services. Gone, uh. so I got not enough out. That was looking myself. I say, never mind, uh, I, I buy a little less, eat a little less. Uh. Then I have one question in my mind. God, I don't have money, no problem. I can. No, pull my belt tighter, it's okay. But next time when I get married, I was not married then. Next time when I get married, I may I will have difficulty to want to send my son to what my son and daughter to university. Because so little money. And I next time when I came out as a priest, so little money. So how? So I, I left the company in those days and I was earning 4,000 plus. 
ต่ท่านคุณเบียร์ปิกมาเนี่ยนะวันละผมเอาเงินเก็บ 1% 40 dollars so when I became a priest I got call to 460 dollars after I finish 10% of what I get so I ask God I knew the amount of money I said God how lah how to to go on I ask them Lecturer, I ask the pastor and ask all the elders. Everybody ask. Everybody say, no answer. Just pray to God. Trust God, lah. Trust God, lah. Maybe you know God will give you a scholarship. Trust God, lah. So I was not satisfied because I say I'm serious, God. I commit to you. I'm serious. I give up my job. I submit. I'm serious. I want. But at this question in my heart, I I still not settled. But how? So when I was first year. It was on first year. Every Thursday, there was a community communion. I mean, the whole Holy Communion service for the whole community, the students, the lecturers, and the staff all attend the communion service. And then communion service. Then that day, one day, there was a Myanmar pastor. This Myanmar pastor is not a tall guy. The Myanmar person is not very tall. So the Myanmar pastor preaching. I didn't hear what he preached last day. So when he finished preaching, at the tea time, I quickly get a cup of tea, walk next to him. Pastor, I like to talk to you. Huh? Well, he said, "Yes, my son." You know, hit on my shoulder. I said, "Yes, my son." What is what he said? Then I told him the story. I said, "I, you know, I know that when I come up to be a priest, I have a little money, so I, I want to uh, get my children to university. Got a problem? I don't want to." Go and get moonlighting to get some other money. You know, do, I, I really fully focus uh, into this ministry. Then my mom has a laugh. Ha 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 ha! He, he touched my shoulder and said, "Brother, I don't have any answer for you, but I tell you a story." So this this my mom has told me this story. He said, 19 years ago, I was like you, young guy." I got married. We prayed to God, and God gave us a daughter. Hallelujah! Praise God! Wow, God gave us a daughter. Then we invited the church, and everybody praised God because I got a daughter. And then, a few months later, we realized that she is a Down syndrome, little girl. We took her to all the possible hospitals. And see whether we can cure her. Everybody say can. The Down syndrome. We cry to God. God, why give us a Down syndrome? We confess our sins. All our sins confess. And our generation sins. Our grandmother sins. All confess. This girl still did not turn good. When she was sixteen years old, she act like a three year old. You see, when there was a few times when we had church together in my house in the vicarage, I got a problem because this girl really like a small little girl, strip herself, put a body right in the middle, sit there, and my wife so shy. Since then, we never have any house gathering anymore. So he says, we dare not have another son, another child. So we ask the doctor. Doctor say no. We can try again. No, not necessary. You know, usually very few two Down syndrome in our family. Very usually very few, very few. So you go, you should go and try. When the girl was 17 years old, over then finally prayed and this decided that they should have a second one. So they tried and they got a second child. And this time the son, they dare not invite anybody. They. Watch the sun. One month. Watch. See Down syndrome or not, or deaf or dumb or whatever. Check. They went to the hospital and check. Doctors come back say, she's a normal child. Normal child. More oh, happy. We invite the whole church to come celebrate now. Thank God. God had heard our prayer. Oh, hallelujah. God praise the Lord. Oh, God had our prayer and celebrate. You know, the, the, the child is normal. You know. Two years later. My son just died. No reason. The doctor couldn't find any reason. Just died. Postmortem came up. Nothing. Just died. 
we both of us cry and cry again. Say, we cry and cry. And say, God, why? You give me a son and you take back. Why? Why, God? And he says, he was touching my shoulder, my brother. My wife and I feel so sad. We want to leave the sad place, the house. We ask the daughter who is 17 years old to be looked after. Nine, by that time, she's 19 years old, to be looked after by a family member. So my wife and I flew here to try to get the relief, a break. I'm here just one month after my son died. I heard that. That was my first year in 1982. And I heard that. I don't know what to say. Then he told me, my brother, if God wants your son or your daughter to go to university, he will find a way. If you want your son and daughter to go to university, you will find your way. Just say, trust God. Look after what God has given you. So my wife and I, we decided after that we married. After I graduate, I married. Then I told her the story, and we decided one should work, not two, because I want to make sure that our family will look after. Because now you look at this, it's like a discipline. I want my family. I say, even though we have little to eat. Never mind, we make do with what we have. Just look after them. My sister say this. My sister also give up her job and say this. So my aunt asked her, You are the graduate, you know, you are the teacher. You can teach so many students in the school. Why you give up and look after your baby? My sister says, I look at myself, I'm a graduate. And I teach other people's children, but I send a maid who have no education to teach my daughter. So my sister decided, that's wrong. So she gave up a job. I teach my daughter. So we agree the same thing. That one, at that time, we were fighting because she earned more than me. She works in the bank. Got more money than me. If you go overtime, like give money up. Maybe padri, sick kids and jala, cukup makan lah. So finally, in the end, we agree. So we work, and then she look after. She walk with the children until all of them go to university. She walk with them all through and go go to university. I want to say, it pays, it does pay. Discipleship is putting Jesus into the life of your children, into them. That's discipleship. If you can do that, the world will change. But because a lot of time, we don't do that. Like my sister said, I am a graduate, I want to teach other people children, but I said, a maid, no education to teach my son. The perspective has changed. The Jewish people don't have this perspective. Their perspective is to they will lead them and train them. Of course, today it will be different. Today is the Old Testament time. They teach them so that all the things is to help them, to nurture them. So I want to say now I am moved faster. Then we go to the New Testament. Uh, I don't think I have enough time to cover all the rest, but I will carry on next tomorrow. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus used the word disciple. And the Jesus discipleship class is that you follow me and watch me all the time. Three years. They're walking with Jesus. They see how he eats, how he sits, how he sleeps, how he how how he pray. He's, they see all the things. How Jesus deal with the situation, how Jesus deal with the sinners, how Jesus deal with the Pharisees. They saw Jesus everything. That's the true discipleship. And I saw Jesus doing that. I asked myself, God, 
I and you give me a church. So how I'm going to develop the church and how I'm going to build the church. So the bishop every year, when I was a priest, every year the bishop was sent one or two students, the seminary students, for the year end practical to my to my church. Every, everyone had to do some practical. So every year they go. So one or two will come to my place. And I resolved, and I have been doing this since I told all of them. First day you come, the student comes to my, my office desk. I give them an exercise book. Take a book. Blank, empty. Put your name, I ask them. This book is not for you to write anything. Just write down every day what do you do with me together. We go every day, are you? Because I'm not going to record for you. I need this record for the report to the bishop and report to the college. So you write down. At the end of the eight weeks, I want you to end there, write your reflection. Not about the church, not about the Sunday school, not about the youth, not about the worship, not about anything about me. Write about me. You like or don't like me, or what strength or weakness I have, you write about me. And I will write back about you. And I will not send to the bishop without giving to you. I will give to you one copy, give to the bishop one copy, and give to the college one copy. I told them. Second thing I want you to do is you stay in my house. I want you to see how I manage my children, how I manage my time. I want you to see, it's very vulnerable and not very open. I've been doing it for the last 20 years when I was in the parish. I say, I want you to see myself, see my life. I want you to see how I prepare myself. Of course, you, I will teach you. You, you will see the time I do. Like, uh, I want you to see how I interact with my wife, how I interact with my children, how I interact. I want you to see, and I want you to see how I interact with my church member, how I interact with the mission. Or, so you, when I say go, you go. If you are hungry, you bring along some food. Because I stop anywhere and I know that when the people who end, they will always come back and say, this is a workaholic pastor. <laughs> workaholic pastor usually a very kind of one and all. But we don't know where he got all his time. You don't know where he got all his time to prepare his sermon. We don't know why again. We can see he's your time to watch TV with the children. You can see him, he can also fold the, the clothing. The, my wife wash all the clothing, I always fold the clothing. And we see him washing the place. He said, we don't know where he get all the time. But he forgot, you know, our, my time is not 24 hours. Maybe 48 hours, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want them to see how I live. I want to see how I deal with my family, do all the things. One way is also that I want to be transparent. And secondly, I want them to see you are going to be a pastor. So you must see how the life of a pastor is. But I want to say not many people do this. Number one, very vulnerable. You open up everything for people to see. All your strength and weaknesses are there. Number two, there's no privacy for you. Every day, somebody will go, go with you all along. So then, as I saw this Jesus disciple school, but today we don't do that anymore. When we don't do that, no wonder there are some crucial moment, crucial thing we never learn because we we never see. It's all done separately. Jesus disciple. And he called intentionally them and he walked with them until the 40 days when Jesus after resurrected and asked them to wait in the, in the day of Pentecost. I think they have to really reflect back all the things that Jesus has said to them. So they want Jesus wanted to see them that he is a teacher, that you are going to be a teacher. He's a leader, that you're going to be a leader. He's a person, you're going to be the person. He's the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, same in the church, same on Sunday, same on Monday, same on Tuesday, same on Wednesday, every day same. 
So Jesus wanted to show them the transparent side of him. And Jesus, great commission, instructed them to go. Say, I didn't instruct you to go, I go with you. I go everywhere with you. So you see how I go, you also go. Then you will do greater things than me, Jesus says. And Jesus, resurrection marks the essential ingredient of going on to discipleship. Jesus do not want just to show them that he died and re- to be resurrected again. Jesus is going to show them the real me. I struggle to go into the cross. You one day may have to struggle. But today we want to be very comfortable. We want to be, I'm not asking everybody must struggle, but prepare. Even when struggle comes, difficult time comes, there will be challenges and difficulty. So the New Testament tells us quite a lot of these things. And then we are going to look at the early church. Next slide. The early church, if you realize that in the early church, in the, all the letters of Paul, or all the epistles, the word disciple never appeared. In the gospel, all disciple, 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 disciple. But in the epistles, no more disciple. It's the church, 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 church. So, same thing. In the early church, it says, follow the way, Acts 19, 9. Nurturing newborn babies, it's like newborn babies. Jaga them, look after them. They are so vulnerable, look after them. 1 Peter, 1 Thessalonians. Jesus' tradition says they will first call Christian, they will call Christian because they other people saw they are like Jesus Christ. They saw them like Jesus Christ. Do things like Jesus Christ. Really, ready to suffer like Jesus Christ. Ready to help people like Jesus Christ. Ready, ready to teach people like Jesus Christ. They saw them. So this was the early church. And the early church took after Jesus. That's why the name Christian was given to them. Today, the word Christian, some people don't like the name Christian already. So now maybe today we better change back to disciple already. So people don't like the word Christian. Hey, yeah, Christian, hey, you better go away like this one, like that one. Next slide. The early church, one believer is called a disciple. Many disciples, they became a church. So the plural of disciple is church. The church is the plural of disciple. Today, we have gathered all the people together. It's like a church. So the New, New Testament don't address individual person. They address the group. The church, the group, the church. Jesus' time, he addressed one by one. The time the church was on form. Yeah. So I'd like to say to you, why do they, uh, they became a church? I have no time to tell you about the early church, when how the early church was suffered very difficult. For two, three hundred years they had to run, suffered, and the Roman Empire never gave them chance, persecute them more and more and more and more and more, and more until they had to hide in the catacombs, they hide in the caves and hide everywhere. And Christians are not allowed, you know, they are worse than slaves. They are thrown into the gladiators, thrown into the lion dens to fight. I want to ask, why do they still want to believe in Jesus? Why? They pray and God never answered them and the lion eat them. They pray and God never helped them and they were fighting the gladiators. Why they still believe? Because in the early church, they are not like today. Little bit suffer and they, oh you God, where are you? Huh? Oh you God, tolong. Huh? Wow, text everybody, please pray, pray. So everybody text the hand on huh? the sign. <laughs> wow. Some text 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Wow. Oh, the, the, pray, 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 pray. <laughs> Next time, huh? Don't, don't put the hand on. Just run a short prayer. Dear Lord, I want to pray for my brother or my sister. No, heal him or help him. 
Amin. Tipen lah, tipen bom the hand ni lah. Today because we all have been bombarded by the world, the world say prosperity first. Even though we say we are not prosperity gospel, but we are prosperity believer. We want the prosperity first. I'm not saying that it's bad, no. But I say that, you know, once you should have Jesus in your life, then you walk with Him. And if you are simple in your life, then a lot of these things is not an issue. But because our life is so complicated, so sophisticated, then all these things are an issue. Go to the traditional churches. Early church, in the early church, they went into the traditional churches. The traditional churches started called catechism. Today, the catechism, we don't even know what it's all about. You know, they, those days, they had the catechism. You know, the intentional discipleship, they used the ditake. The ditake in AD 50 to 850, there was a proof of the apostolic preaching by Irenaeus. You know, in, the, in those in the typical time, in the suffering days, in the persecution days, they had this ditake. That means they had this teaching. The teaching was there. You know, today the word didache comes from the word didactic. It's come from here, uh, this word. So it was the apostolic tradition by the Hippolytus, Bishop of Rome. You know, they are still before Constantine. They are still under persecution time. They already developed catechism to teach, train them, to teach them to how to put Jesus into their life. Because of Jesus in their life, they became martyr. No Jesus in their life, no matter. Because Jesus was in their life. The believers who learn the creeds by heart, so they find the creed, by the time the creed comes out, it was already in the Constantine time. I just want to quickly just say, for the three, first 300 years, the disciples were so persecuted, they hide themselves. And when Constantine came in 313 AD, and he became the emperor. In 314, the edict of Milan came and said Christians can, can take up public service, can be soldiers, don't have to hide, you know, not, not outcast. So there's an edict of Milan. And so when Constantine had the edict of Milan, Christians all came out, you know, the church began to build, a lot of churches started to build. Hagia Sophia, you know, was started to build in Turkey, in Istanbul and many churches starting to build. Immediately the first 50 years, from Constantine, the first 50 years, all the doctrines that you believe today, and I believe today, were produced. The doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of, of, uh, of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of eschatology, eschatology, all the doctrines that we all believe today, we put it into the creed, and that's a creed. So their creed became the teaching. So this is what you believe. This is, you know, it's not I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Then they explain to them what is that. I believe in the Holy Spirit and explain. So the doctrine. How I ask the question, you are underground, at that time the church was underground, there was no Bible, New New Testament Bible, not yet, no, you, only you have portions of scripture floating here and there, you have no seminary, no Bible school, no ATI, no, no nothing, and all these people can produce doctrines. Who taught them? Where do they learn from? And where do they, why do they have learn? Can get all these things done. Constantine sponsored six ecumenical in council. They call ecumenical council. It was a council where all the bishops came together and produced the New Testament, produced the creed, produced the, the, the apostolic succession, produced all the doctrines. There were six ecumenical council in 50 years. And all these people came out. And they were the one who was gone through because they have Jesus today we speak we have the Holy Spirit we have the Holy Spirit in us so that's the teaching that they have 
We need to learn to do this teaching. Not just to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit and then after that, a base. So you die. No, you receive the Holy Spirit, then you can walk in the Holy Spirit. Live by the Holy Spirit. We need to walk with that. The Catholics have the Catholic Catechism. The early days was Catholic. Even Pope Francis, when he became the Pope, you know, he asked the church, let us be a community of missionary disciples. Just don't become missionary, go anywhere, start church. Go and lead them, train them intentionally, make disciples of them. Oh, I quickly finish that. Orthodox Church, same thing. The Orthodox Church call it Theosis. Or Theosis. You know, it means it's a, it's a road that you can jalan together with him. Discipleship takes a long, along this road until eventually the human mirror is no longer seen but only the reflection, reflected glory of God. That means you, you walk with Jesus, walk with Jesus until no more seeing you is only seeing Jesus in you. That's the Orthodox Church really. But of course, they are also over the years slack, slack, nah, like us, nah, slack, slack. They often paid a high price for speaking openly against those who were following the ways of the world. That's the Orthodox Church. I'm looking at the early part of the Orthodox Church, the traditional one. The Anglican Church, we have Cranmer. Thomas Cranmer had the Catechism in the Book of Common Prayer. But today, we don't know where to find it. Really. Book of Common Prayer pun tak tahu. Lupa macam mana lah. Uh. But here he says, the curate of every parish or some other of his appointments shall diligently appoint Sundays and holy days half an hour before even so. Ah. Right. Openly in the church instruct and examine so many children of the parish sent unto him as the time will serve and as he shall think convenient in some part of this catechism. He says, keep teaching. Teaching is to model to them, model yourself to them. Francis Assisi in the 12th century was the famous thing is that one day, you know, he told the, his monks, he's a monk, you know, told his monk, he said, Let, we are doing evangelism today, we are talking about evangelism, let's go to the marketplace. So all went to the market, or we wear the robes, you know, monk robes and went to the marketplace. And Francis Assisi and the monks all following him and watching, you know, he went to the store, you know, uh, how are you? Did you sell any apple today? Oh wow, the Hey, uh, how's your mother? You know, and then he say a prayer here, and then we walk around, walk around, you know. Then he say, hi, bye, 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 go back. Then he asks his students, the monks to sit down and say, uh, anybody, anybody have any question? Someone monk raised his hand. You know, father, calling Francis, I say, father, father, I thought you say you do evangelism. You go out there, but you never say, speak a word of the gospel. You ask people, how are you? Do you sell apples? Do you do all this? Oh, how is your father? How is your family? You know what, what Francis Assisi said? He says, if these people don't see Jesus in you, whatever you say, nobody listen. When these people in the market don't see Jesus in you, whatever you say, Nobody will listen. So the Catechism is supposed to be like that. It is to teach and model and wrap onto them the life. So the Anglican Catechism program, we started, like churches like us, like this, they started by the USPG, later on by CMS, you know, and we teach the Bible, the Creed, the Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Sacrament, and the Book of Common Prayer. At that time, they were serious. If you don't know how to recite the creed, don't know how to recite the commandments, don't know how to recite the Lord's Prayer, you cannot get baptized. Today, all the baptized don't know whether they can recite all this or not. Don't ask lah. Huh? Don't ask lah. <laughs> don't ask lah. <laughs> so the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Brethren, etc. have their own catechism class. They have class preparing for the new believers. So, but I want to say to you, after over the 20 years, over the 20 years, 
how I grow my church. Uh, I asked God how to grow the church. And then I thought my brilliant idea from the seminary, got a lot of knowledge. Uh, all the seminary students come out, oh, all knowledge, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. I would say, well, let's have a, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what class they call uh, I forgot the name. Uh, name. Huh? No, no, so, I'm sorry, I, 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 now I don't remember. So I, I was watching, I was going to the, the people and I realized that they a lot, all baptized, you know, but they don't know, they know, don't know the baptism. Don't know real things about this because those days don't know whether who teach them or so. But anyway, then I say, okay, let's let's have a class for baptism class. Re re study the baptism class again. Whoa! I announced few weeks, you know, you know, at this hour, this day, few weeks, you know. So I uh, open the church that day with all the fan, no no aircon time, the time no aircon, all the fan. So I open everything, waited, waited. You know how many people come? No one came, but only the angels came. Oh. <laughs> I was waiting for one hour. Not one person came. Then the following week and other weeks I asked, what happened? Why didn't you all come? We all baptized already. We about to attend another baptism class. Huh? No need. Huh? Then later on, the same week, I was reading the Star newspaper those days. Huh? Star newspaper. Today nobody read them. Huh? Uh, those days, those days, you the Sun newspaper. Then I saw that one small column basic Hinduism class every Monday at 7 pm free of charge at this place. Ah! I pull out the baptism cover, I put a new cover, say basic Christianity class. And I guarantee they don't know, literally, they don't know. I pull up the cover. You know, it was baptism, so I put that basic Christianity. Then I said, okay, now we have basic Christianity class. Then everybody asked me, hey, Pastor, what is basic Christianity class? I said, do you know why Jesus must die on the cross? Don't know, don't know then, and then. <laughs> why Jesus cannot die by, you know, people shoot him by gun, <clears throat> or hang him, don't know, come, come on. Ah, do you know why can, Christian cannot eat food offered to idols? Don't know, come. Wow. So, then suddenly I started the basic Christian, Christianity class. Actually, it's a baptism class. Exactly the same thing. I didn't change anything. I went through and I changed the cover. So, I taught this class 20 years. I taught through. It was 14 sessions. So, I, I, I start with half an hour. I told them, half an hour. Ask any questions you can ask before we start our class. You no know question, then I'll start my class. Ask any question. So some people have questions, I ask, and I, if I can answer, I answer. If not, I jot down, I'm going to look for answer for them. But then I start the class. So I have people who attend the class one time, two times, three rounds, four rounds, five rounds. And 20 years, I have not done evangelism rarely. I, would, I did because the diocese wants it, or the, the archdiocese wants it, or the board wants it. But all my people came from the class. I knew them and walked with them 20 years. First, one class. Then we went to two classes. Then we went to three classes. Then we went to four classes. I was very busy, but I only attended class. And I, that is my catechism that walked through with them. I literally walked through with them and I spent not only one week, one month, 14 weeks, that is three plus months, I knew them. And many of them stay on. So I want to say to you, I truly believe this because I went through myself early days and I believe this is strong and that class will shape you and that is how you shape them in the life. Help us cost. And in 1993, I went to Holy Trinity Brompton and saw Nikki Gumbel. And Nikki Gumbel gave me the help us cost. At that time, the help us cost was only localized in HDB, it's not well, worldwide. I said, Can I take your thing back to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can pull out the cover and do whatever you want. Then I look at it inside. 
similar to my baptism class. We talk about the, the earliest with basic faith. And I have read more things than him. Then I saw, he said he did 12 sessions. And I did 14. Then I asked him, why 12? He says, no special on 12. It's just that you have enough time because he walked through the Alpha course. He says the first lesson, second lesson, third lesson is the people can drop in and drop out. And by the time after the fourth lesson, you know who will stay. And then the fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, you capture them and you make them a group. And you make them trust you. Make them a group. Then I say I can 14 lessons. Hey, I work like him. So I work exactly like him. The only thing that I don't have is food. But I have a lot of laughter. I have a lot of questions for them. So, but for 20 years, I walked through and my church grew from one service and became five services. And then not including other outreach later on, more and more outreaches. So I want to say it is workable, it's possible. The Catechism movement was a backbone those days of all mission, Anglican mission in the 19th century. Either in Africa, India, North America, Latin America, the Arctic, Australia, China, Burma, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Philippines, Korea, Japan, and more. Those days they use those methods. Unfortunately, today no, they don't use it anymore. And our church all forgot we don't use it anymore. Just revisited all these things of the past. They have done great things. That's why we have churches that stays for a long time. And I will quickly go. So discipleship is not a cost. There are many courses I can tell you. Whole life discipleship, you can click whole life discipleship. There's internet, you can find it. Or rooted in Jesus there. Or baptism confirmation classes, baptism governor. Covenant, all these things you can find in any different denomination that are there. Or basic Christianity course where I develop, or life in the spirit, walking with the spirit, Sunday school, you fellowship, self group, inside with Jesus, victorious Christian life, compassion, in international. All these things are all available. The question is that I want to ask the question Do you have a target? Who are you? doing with. You say, say I am not a disciple, then don't worry. Who are you doing with? That person may not be your disciple. You may be his disciple or her disciple. Never mind. Do together. Then you be a partner. You can journey together. Do you have anyone? Your target? It can be your children. It can be your grandchildren. It can be your neighbor. You can be your office staff. You can be someone else. Do you have someone? If you have no one, guarantee it will not happen. But you have someone. You just pray for the opportunity to come. It will come. So today, churches have a lot of causes. But the thing is that it's not the cause that you attend. It's you attend. Who are you attending with? And journey together. And if you can journey with that person 10 weeks, you have 10 weeks together, you know each other much more. The next time when you see in another crowd, hey, I see you, hey, I see you, because 10 weeks you know each other. And you become friends. And later on from there, you become comrades and partner. And later on, furthermore, you become soulmate. Right, I end here by I ask question. Four questions for you to think of. According to the Bible, what is real discipleship? So you think about it. What will happen when churches do not have discipleship program? They will have a lot of fellowship program. A lot of activities program. Because they don't have discipleship program. The discipleship doesn't mean that you only study the Bible, you don't do other things. You know. Discipleship is a modeling. You can still have your, your music and model and then to wrap on to the new music 
uh, workers together or people together. Or you can have senior people or you have youth, and the discipleship is someone walking with you, rapping with you, studying the Bible, understanding whether you really study the Bible or you really know, maybe you don't need to really study the Bible again, maybe you just ask hard questions. What is discipleship level in our present church? How can we improve on this? How much discipleship? I think every church has some sort of discipleship. But now we need to improve further on. Whose responsibility is it? Dina must be the Dina. The uh, buck stops. The Dean cannot do everything. <laughs> Whose discipleship? Whose responsibility? So I stop here. Thank you, everybody. I just want to uh, introduce you this book. Uh, I will give this book to the dean so that he at least has one copy. This is called Intentional Discipleship and Disciple Making by the Anglican Communion. I, 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 sorry, la, I'm the chair. La. So, because I'm the chair, I wrote the preface. So we all work together as a team. So I wrote the preface for my name. La, uh, not, not, not so great. Nah. So the idea of this book is uh, we wanted to hold communion uh, to to enter into discipleship because we know that the Anglican Church is already uh, not, not functioning very well in this area. Now we are talking about sex and all this sex and everything and nothing to do with discipleship. <laughs> so we, we cover the biblical theology, we cover discipleship early church, the Roman Catholic discipleship, Orthodox tradition, some of the things I, I quote from here, and the history of Anglican formation, the five marks uh, vision, the healing discipleship, uh, and all this discipleship. And we have examples of discipleship throughout the world, in Africa, Asia, Europe, America, and everywhere. So then, we, uh, we wrote quite a lot of resources. Uh, we have put it all into the web, Actually, it's all you can download it. It's free. And this book, of course, you want to buy is hard copy. You have to print and then you have to pay lah. But this book is a life guide. It's twelve parts. Uh, I, I purposely asked Bishop Donner. Bishop Donner is one of the contributors uh, on one of the articles here. And there are different people who are talking about the life guide. Uh, is Jewish discipleship, discipleship, Jesus and his disciple, disciple in the early church, disciple in the Christian culture, disciple in the global context, discipleship in families, discipleship in workplace, discipleship in transforming, transform communities and done all the things. So I will leave one of these books and we also wrote a catechism, a catechesis. Uh, this catechesis is a uh, is a very a brief catechesis that what we should cover and of course there we have also introduction of all this discussion uh, that we see more and more. Okay. Ini saya give you as a gift.